Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you to the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University for putting this talk together. My name is Elizabeth Reynolds, and I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Washington University in St. Louis. And it is my pleasure to be introducing Pat Giersch, professor of history at Wellesley College, whose book, Corporate Conquests, Business, the State, and the Origins of Ethnic Inequality in Southwest China came out earlier this year from Stanford University Press. Over the course of this talk, if you have any questions uh, for Pat Giersch um, or about the book, please feel free to post them in the chat box on the Weatherhead Institute's YouTube page. This was a very exciting book for me to read, one that refocuses the borderlands through a deeply researched history of business, merchants, and state enterprise and places them squarely within the narrative of how today's China came to be at a time uh, when understanding the Chinese borderlands is really of utmost importance. And with that, I turn it over to you, Pat. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. I also wanted to thank the Weatherhead uh, East Asia Institute. Wanted to thank Gray Tuttle also for inviting me uh, to do this. Um, Modern T Tibetan Studies at Columbia uh, is also a sponsor and I thank them for the privilege uh, of this opportunity. And Elizabeth, I really wanted to thank you as well. I know this is a very busy time for you in terms of your work, uh, your teaching and your, and your research. Uh, so thanks so much for joining me here. It is uh, such, a, such a pleasure. So in terms of describing the book, I wanted to begin uh, not at the beginning um, but actually uh, near the end of the book. So the book covers the, the mid 19th century uh, through the 1950s, uh, but I wanted to start in the period 1939 to 1948, uh, a decade which I, I found particularly uh, interesting. And I wanted to share um, a couple of slides as well. So I can situate you not just in uh, time, but also in uh, space. And so if I can get these slides to work there. So we're going to be starting in 1939 to 1948, and we're going to be starting uh, in China, but in western uh, Yunnan province down in southwest China. And as we go through the talk, uh, I'm going to mention uh, eastern Tibet, uh, or Kham, uh, Sichuan, Tibet, uh, Xinjiang, uh, in also Eastern China uh, or China proper, uh, Neidi. So these are just, this is just to help you sort of uh, understand spatially uh, where we are. And in particular, we're gonna start in uh, the Western Thai ruled regions of, uh, of Yunnan uh, and in the domain of uh, Ganyai. And you can follow along sort of some of the names uh, and issues that I'm talking about uh, on the right there. So in 1939, the British consul of Western uh, Yunnan, a man named Stockley, visited the hereditary leader of Ganyai, uh, an ethnic, ethnic Thai named uh, Dao Chengyue. Uh, Stockley found Chengyue dressed in his usual European cut suit and feeling quite frustrated, feeling quite frustrated uh, about the lack of Thai representation in the Chinese nationalist government. Now, Cheng Yue was an interesting fellow. He was uh, educated in Rangoon. He could speak Mandarin uh, and English as well as his native uh, Northern Thai dialect. Uh, he came from a fairly worldly family. His grandfather, uh, Dao Anren, uh, had been to Japan, had been uh, educated there a little bit had been part of the revolutionary movement that brought down China's last dynasty, uh, the Qing dynasty, and had also experimented uh, with uh, various forms of economic development for Ganyai. Uh, this is something that uh, Roger DeForge has uh, discussed a little bit uh, in uh, one of his uh, books. What Stockley and Cheng Yue discussed in that conversation was a special area for Western Yunnan, a place where the Thai elite would maintain autonomy, political autonomy, and also have a voice in China's governance. So the point is that in the 1930s, 
And into the 1940s, the Thai elite of Western Yunnan were talking about autonomy. Now the nationalist government, China's gov central government became alarmed about this and sent in agents to investigate and they gathered intelligence and used that intelligence to try to prosecute Dao Chongyu and his father, uh, Dao Baotu, uh, for treason. The press got hold of this story and further sensationalized it, saying that the Western uh, Yunnan Thai aristocrats were importing weapons from Burma and they were going to plan to fight for independence. They were going to spread that fight northward into Sichuan to include Eastern Tibetans or Kampas, as well as uh, Yi in uh, Southern uh, Sichuan. References in the press to the independent uh, state of outer Mongolia at the time and to the independent government in central Tibet further infl inflamed the situation. It looked possible that uh, Yunnanese troops or central government troops might actually uh, invade Western Yunnan uh, after the war in the late 1940s uh, because of this. Now in the end, the invasion did not happen and the Thai hereditary elite kept control over these regions uh, through the mid 1950s or so. But a military solution to this issue of autonomy or discussions about autonomy was easily imaginable. Dao Pao Baotu, when he was younger in the 1920s had watched Yunnan provincial troops come into Ganyai, burn his family's residence to the ground and take his mother hostage. And there were other uh, fairly uh, violent incidents between Yunnanese soldiers and Thai militias uh, in the 1930s. What I'm arguing is that uh, this story about the pursuit of autonomy and the violence and threats of violence that it unleashed offers really important insights about massive changes that were taking place uh, across Western China. Uh, in this time period, in the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, uh, and 40s. Uh, so we're not talking just about Western Yunnan, but in some ways also about developments in Mongolia, Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, uh, Kham, uh, and so on. Um, for the uh, Thai elite, just as for contemporary uh, Turkic speaking elites in the Northwest, uh, Tibetan elites, Mongol elites, there's a deep understanding at this point in time that the world around them was rapidly changing. And from the 1910s through the 1940s, the response to that change by some in the Northwest uh, and in central Tibet and in Mongolia was to try uh, to build their own states and nations. For the Thai of Western Yunnan, it was the search for autonomy or a special region, a concept that was based on developments uh, actually in upper Burma across the border from Western Yunnan. Um, the discussion of a special region was based on uh, the experience of Thai elite in upper Burma uh, who themselves had these types of uh, pr political privileges and political uh, autonomy. And their relatives in Western Yunnan uh, knew this. The Thai of the Shan states of Upper Burma had a form of representation from the mid 1930s or so. And after the war, after 1945, Upper Burma's Thai, Kachin and others asked for and received internal autonomy as a precondition for incorporation into an independent federated Burma. And so it's within this context that Western Yunnan Thai, uh, including uh, Dao Chongyu, were discussing and meeting to plan for a political future in which they sought high degrees uh, of autonomy. Okay. So I lured you into this talk uh, with a title called Corporate Conquests, Business, the State and the Origins of Ethnic Inequality in Southwest China. And so what does this opening prelude have to do with corporations in, and inequality? For the Thai elite, uh, economic development 
and especially control over economic development and local resources was integral to the issue of autonomy. And we have one plan from 1947, which really shows this. It was a plan both for Thai political authority in the Western Yunnan um, borderlands, as well as a plan for economic development that was locally controlled. The plan here, I show you um, uh, a photo of the, from the table of contents. It was created by a name, man named Fang Keshang, also a Thai aristocrat related to Dao Chong Yu. You can see a picture of Fang Keshang right in the center of the photograph there, the tall man uh, with the big shiny boots. What Fang's uh, border region plans uh, articulated was that there should be Thai elite control, political authority in Western Yunnan because the Thai elite were the ones who could actually act as a bridge between borderland people and the Chinese state. But another important aspect of this plan for the border regions was a plan for sustainable economic development that brought local control over resources into Thai, Han, the Thai hands. Um, all of this, uh, Fang Keshang argued, um, was incredibly important because it would produce a society in which the barriers between the Thai minority and China's Han majority would be lowered and the potential for ethnic conflict would be reduced. Now, Fang Keshang's emphasis on development that empowered Thai producers and local leaders is particularly interesting. And he was responding in terms of this emphasis to two major trends in the 19th and 20th centuries. And it's these two major trends that are the focus uh, of the book or one of the major focuses of, of the book. Uh, those two trends were one, the growth of private companies that controlled regional commerce and could increasingly reach deep into local communities to gain control over local reef resources, sort of taking the advantage of the control of those resources away from local communities. The second trend was Chinese state and nation building that sought to reconfigure power in the borderlands, whether in Yunnan province in Western Sichuan which the book looks at, or in some of the other regions that I had mentioned uh, earlier, Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, and so on. Now, fundamentally to this, I'm gonna take, take down the slides quickly and sort of uh, bounce back and forth between um, me and the, and the slides. Fundamental to those patterns of nation and state building were four aspects which I wanted to emphasize uh, quickly. First, was a repudiation by Chinese governments of shared rule with indigenous elites, such as the Thai. Now this was a theoretical repudiation and it was difficult to actually uh, pull off, but it was uh, a repudiation uh, nonetheless. And the book starts um, and, and sort of tells that story of the repudiation of shared rule by starting in Xinjiang in the 1870s and 1880s uh, where I think the trend really started and then uh, traces it just really briefly as it spreads to Mongolia, Kham, uh, into Tibet and down into the Southwest, uh, such as into uh, Yunnan. A second aspect that was fundamental to this uh, nation and state building was a new vision of the borderlands, a vision of the borderlands as both alien and Chinese. It was Chinese sovereign soil inhabited by alien backwards communities, such as the Thai. And because they were there, it made the Chinese soil vulnerable to foreign powers. Third fundamental aspect of this nation and state building was a new vision of the state's responsibilities, a new idea of what a state is and does. It must use economic development to control and domesticate the people's territories and resources of the borderlands. And fourth, 
Fourth aspect was an effort to build the institutions, especially corporations that could do the controlling and the domesticating. So Fang Kesheng, when he developed his plan uh, for developing Western Yunnan, he was taking on a powerful set of institutions and ideas rein reinforced by decades of corporate development, both private and public. And he was also taking on a powerful set of ideas reinforced by decades of state actors depicting borderlands peoples as backwards and needed in need of outside state-led uh, intervention. So while we can definitely say that Fang's plan was extremely self-serving, I would argue too that it was a radical alternative vision for a national future, a vision of cooperation and local empowerment for minority communities that has sometimes though rarely been embraced over the past 70 years. There's been good work on economic development in borderlands areas um, in the period after 1949. And I, as I've read that work, I think a lot of the emphasis is on the fact that the state takes away local control over local futures and local resources. And that process in turn helps to produce inequality as outside state-led corporations, as outside private corporations begin to come in, there emerge important uh, income inequalities inequalities in terms of opportunity, in terms of access to jobs, in terms of access to the benefits from uh, development. Now, a number of scholars, as I said, have done good work on this in the post-1949 period. Um, one of my favorite is Andrew Fisher in his book, uh, which uh, discusses disempowered development uh, in Tibet. And um, I uh, actually adopt that term. I think this is an important uh, idea, disempowered development. And I think some of my contributions are to try to demonstrate how disempowered development is really, um, it, 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 it was initiated in the early efforts at uh, modernization uh, in China. In other words, it's absolutely intertwined with ideas about uh, economic development and modernization in China in ways that it almost can't be, they can't be uh, separated. Even today, as we hear about uh, the latest efforts over the last three or four years of um, efforts to eradicate poverty and uh, inequality uh, across China, Xi Jinping's great plan for poverty alleviation, which is uh, supposed to come due uh, this year. I'm hearing from people um, who not, know much more about it uh, than me, that these latest, latest efforts really, they really hinge on whether there's uh, local control over resources, local control over futures, the sort of local control that Fang Kashang was arguing uh, for. If local coal control can be negotiated, there might be success. And if it can't, um, people have doubts about the long-term viability uh, of these efforts. I have to say that I'm a little bit pessimistic. The history of development in borderland regions and minority regions in particular, the work that I've done, um, which looks at the roles of state and private corporate activity in particular, suggests that Disempowerment and inequality will be the primary outcomes uh, of these latest uh, efforts. That again, development thinking and action in modern China may not actually be possible without structuring in unequal outcomes, uh, un inequality along ethnic uh, lines. So in a, in a sense, this book um, tries to deal with some fairly local level issues. You know, why did Fang Kesheng create this plan for developing uh, the border area? But at the same time, it's trying to address what I think are some major and central questions uh, for China as a whole. Why over the last 70 or, or so years have efforts at uh, political autonomy that allows local communities economic to to uh, control their economic re resources and empower themselves. Why have they largely failed? 
That's sort of the big question. So I, I believe this story is not just a local story. It's not just a Southwest story. It's not just a West China story. It's a, really a China story. And it really, I, I'd like to see uh, that it would shape our collective teaching and learning about China uh, as we go forward. So why Fang Kusheng created his plan, why it failed is uh, one of the things that the book is doing. And a lot of the answers to that has to do with corporations. And so I, I became fascinated with uh, corporations, um, both private and state. And so let me shift gears a little bit, sort of away from kind of the uh, big overview of the book uh, in order to go into, to, to relate a couple of stories that are, are in the book that are important to the book. Um, but uh, let me tell those stories. And if there's time, I'll, I'll uh, tie them back into the big picture, or perhaps we can do that in my discussion with Elizabeth um, or in, uh, in the Q&A. So in order to start my first uh, story, let me go back to my slides. Um, and um, the first, first story I wanted to tell was about the uh, company called Yongchangshan. Uh, it's most associated with a man named uh, Yan Zhejun, who was from Xizhou in uh, Yunnan. At the tender age of about 13 or so, uh, Yan Zhejun had struck out on his own, borrowing money from a maternal relative, purchasing a donkey, and sort of traipsing from village to village uh, near Xizhou in order to, to sell cloth. As his income increased, Yan bought a mule and a horse, and he began uh, to uh, travel much further for business. He would go up to Sichuan and purchase silk, take that down to the Burma border, uh, sell it so it could be exported. And at the Burma border, he purchased um, imported yarns, machine spun yarns, which he then brought back up to uh, Sichuan uh, to sell. In his travels, he met a man, man named Peng in Sichuan, a native of Jiangxi uh, province. And he also met another man from the Shizhou area, a man named Yang, uh, who traded uh, not into Sichuan, but from Shizhou up north to Lijiang and then up into Eastern Tibet or Kham. He would export Yunnan tea there and then he would import from Kham um, medicinal materials, sort of tradition, traditional medicines uh, such as caterpillar fungus uh, and, um, and musk. So this trio, Yan, Peng, Yang, together uh, with a couple of other equity investors would create the firm Yongchangshan. Started in 1903, Yongchangshan originally therefore linked Sichuan, Sichuan with Burma and Yunnan with Kham. Um, like a lot of other Yunnan firms that were be, being started at that time. Yongchangshan would become one of the more successful ones, growing and diversifying over the years, drawing in other investors and investing in other businesses. And by the early 1950s, the firm controlled an estimated several billion renminbi in assets, distributed among uh, its many businesses and its many branches of its business, which were scattered from Sichuan to Shanghai, to Hong Kong, India, uh, and Burma. So Yongchangshan had made Yan Zijun and some of the other partners uh, into very rich uh, men. They went from being muleteers to being millionaires. And my basic question as I was learning uh, this story was how did these three itinerant merchants build a transnational firm of such magnitude? And a follow-up question to that was, you know, what sort of impact did this have on uh, some of the places that they did business, including in Calm? The answers to this question, these questions lie not just in the story of a single company, but actually in the history of the transformation of business in Yunnan uh, as a whole. From the mid 19th century up through the first half of the 20th century, we have a lot of people in a number of different towns forming businesses. Most of these businesses were partnerships and the partnership was a, a extremely flexible and important uh, approach to business formation 
uh, in Yunnan. The partnership model would be crucial to Yongchangshan uh, throughout the firm's uh, life. Um, but also important to its initial growth and then to its later successes was its ability to expand geographically and to open up branches in Kham, in Burma, later in India, Hong Kong, uh, and so on. So the creation of branch offices uh, was extraordinarily important. And the challenge for the shareholders, the partners, such as Yan Zijun, Peng Yang, was uh, how to get the branch managers uh, so that they were incentivized to continue to make money for the firm. How could a firm prevent people who are hundreds of miles away, perhaps a thousand miles away, how could they prevent them from just being lazy or stealing from the firm or, or whatever? How do you bind far-flung managers into loyalty to the home uh, office? It's an important question for almost any business. And what I've found is that uh, corporate regulations, careful record keeping, including accounting, communications, and a profit sharing system that rewarded employees were really uh, important, not just to Yongchangshan, but to these other trading companies coming out of Yunnan that had to cover really vast distances. So the book does a little bit of a deep dive into record keeping, uh, corporate governance, uh, accounting, and so on. Um, these topics, which are so sexy, I'm sure that it's just going to make the book uh, fly off the shelves. More seriously, I actually wanted to argue uh, or try to make the case that these issues of accounting and corporate governance really are not only important, but kind of interesting uh, as well. And I wanted to read a little bit from the book right now to sort of give you a flavor or a sense of how the book assesses uh, these issues. So here's a little bit from uh, the book. To build their businesses, Yunnan merchants borrowed specific bookkeeping and reporting practices that underpinned a particular approach to business management. These practices appear to have originated with the Shanxi banks, and the Shanxi practices helped some Yunnanese to develop a mastery of accounting and management that allowed their shareholding firms to operate over the great distances and rugged landscapes of the Southwest and beyond. The key to conquering geography and topography lay in the possibilities that record keeping could reshape relationships and behavior. Acquaintances, relatives, or neighbors might be recruited as managers or employees, but the Yunnanese entrepreneurs did not rely solely or even mainly on the loyalties of friendship and kinship to encourage others to serve the firm. Instead, they reinforced the soft discourse of kinship and friendship with the hard technologies of record keeping to create a powerful emphasis on professional competence and devotion to the firm. Competence and devotion were defined not by kinship or friendship itself, but by hard work and profit. And competence was evaluated by examining the ledgers, which revealed the operation of each branch of the firm. Gradually then, a person's worth was made calculable and that calculability was designed to influence his behavior to align his interests with those of the shareholders, allowing them to trust him even if he were hundreds or thousands of miles away. We might consider that accounting and managerial strategies were technologies related to the reshaping of behavior and relationships. An argument proposed by the new accounting historians who interpret bookkeeping as a discursive practice, bringing into being new categories, concepts, or ideas, some of them designed as Christopher Napier puts it, to enable people to act in ways that would previously not have been conceivable. To encourage employees to act in new ways, Yunnanese firm owners adopted careful accounting methods to track their firm's many transactions. These figures were then used to calculate and divide profit. And this allowed the Yunnan firms to operate across vast distances. The fact that they could operate on such scales, moreover, brought power to the firms, power in the form of wealth and knowledge. And that knowledge was absorbed by the firms as they gained greater control over long distance trade. Thus the cumulative actions of profit oriented merchant firms were reshaping borderlands livelihoods and 
communities. Now, the book goes on to trace the success of Yongchang Shang and other firms in terms of reaching into Burma uh, and later into Kham and Vietnam, Hong Kong, uh, and India. It also explores how they reshaped borderland livelihoods and communities, including the hometowns of the merchants themselves. Money poured into places like Xizhou, making them prosperous oases in a region where poverty and want were quite common. In contrast, I also investigate places where the power of private firms became alarming, such as in the Thai regions of Western Yunnan. But frankly, I actually have better evidence uh, about the activities of Yunnan firms in Eastern Tibet uh, or Kham. And I wanted to bring this up too because um, Elizabeth is here and her ongoing work is currently uh, redefining economic and business history uh, in Kham and uh, Tibet. Now Kham, in other words, these regions, this region up here became an important market for Yunnan firms as they expanded. And also of course, a source of those tr traditional Chinese medicines uh, that they exported out of there uh, and actually then distributed uh, around China into Southeast Asia and so on, some, sometimes even into, um, into Europe. Um, we can go through the account books of the firms such as Yongtangshan, which I have done, and we can really sort of trace the import and export uh, of goods from Kham. Um, what's important, I think, is that we can also really document the structure of that trade and how it developed. Increasingly, these more powerful firms were reaching into Kham and really gaining control over um, access to medicinal materials. Now, Kampa families, Tibetan families, might do a lot of the gathering, but Unsurprisingly, they've had very few options for where to sell or trade what they gathered. And so it was really the companies that were uh, gaining the most profit from this commercialization of Eastern Tibet or Kham. And the firms even developed increasingly direct access to uh, the gathering process, often bypassing Kampa producers, and they did this through contracting with Sichuanese migrants who came in and started to do quite a bit of the harvesting, for example, of caterpillar fungus. And so what I'm arguing then was that there was a trend towards Yunnan merchant firms making greater inroads uh, into Kham, and that the commerce that was being uh, developed there were opening up opportunities for Kampa families to participate in the market, but they didn't get a lot of leverage uh, in order to really improve their livelihoods. There was a real inequality in terms of who benefited uh, from this growing commerce. So that's one story that I wanted uh, to relate today. And let me jump into uh, another. It's about the state and the mechanization uh, of mining, the industrialization of mining. Um, in 1928, much to his surprise, I think, this man, Miao Yuntai, uh, was appointed by the Yunnan provincial government as the key architect of Yunnan's economic future. I'm unique, I think, uh, maybe not, but I think in arguing that uh, Miao would go on to become a visionary of uh, importance, not just for the province of Yunnan, but actually for China as a whole. Now others, especially Shi Yun have captured the specifics of how Miao uh, and his colleagues designed successful financial and monetary systems that made uh, Yunnan in the 1930s uh, quite autonomous, autonomous from the central government um, 
at least until 1938 or so. But I was much more captivated, actually, um, by how uh, Miao reformed and built state-run corporations. Um, Miao Yuntai's first great breakthrough was to create a state-run corporation that produced through mechanical washing and refining a tin of such high quality that it could be sold via the London Metal Exchange um, on, the global, on global markets. In other words, uh, he was the first really to bring modern industry uh, to Yunnan uh, province. What's interesting is that, um, you know, he wasn't the first to try. Actually, the dream of industrializing Yunnan mining began uh, with a man named uh, Liu Changyo, an official in Yunnan in 1876. So 50 some odd years earlier. What Liu Changyo sought to do was to mechanize Yunnan mining in order to bring in more revenue to support troops that could secure Yunnan as a border province. Uh, in particular, secure it against the French in Vietnam and the British uh, in Burma. What's so fascinating about Liu Changyo was that in his ideas and language, as he described this relationship between strategic defense and industry, um, he was very similar to his fellow Hunanese, uh, Zhuo Zongtang, who was just at this time, at the same time, be beginning uh, the Chinese government's uh, reconquest of Xinjiang. Both men adv advocated a more aggressive approach to borderlands governance, including greater control over indigenous communities and including the rejection of shared governance with uh, local indigenous elites. And as I said earlier, these ideas would spread to Taiwan, Mongolia, uh, Tibet, uh, and so on, as ideas about governance were being revolutionized in the late 19th century. For Liu Changyo, though, uh, part of this revolution in governance, governance uh, was uh, the desire to include industrial, industrialization of mining as part of the process. Now, Liu Changyo was not able to pursue his plans, uh, but some of his successors were. And um, in the 1880s, a state-run corporation, a state-run joint stock corporation was created in order to mechanize mining uh, in Yunnan. The company was desi designed to uh, develop mining, bring in more revenue that could then increase the state's control over uh, Yunnan to thwart foreign um, interests and also to consolidate control over indigenous communities. All right. Now, other scholars uh, have looked at early industrial development and in particular mineral exploitation as a means for state strengthening and um, building China's new sort of approach to uh, sovereignty uh, in a competitive uh, world. So in a sense, I'm actually telling, retelling a story that's been told um, quite a number of times uh, before. And the question is why, you know, why do this? Uh, what's new here? I think that in telling our stories about modern China, uh, we tend to rarely consider carefully what it means to really write a story about China as a whole. And we tend to privilege Neidi or China proper, Eastern China. But we should try to, uh, I think, move beyond that. When we look at industrialization, especially the industrialization of mining in the ways that it was discussed for Yunnan and Sichuan, which I do in the book, then it becomes really clear that from early on, these Western regions were conceived of as quite different than East China. And let me just give you a couple of examples. In the wake of the defeat to Japan in 1895, the first Sino-Japanese War, 1894, 1895, the imperial court proposed that each province survey its mineral deposits. Um, suggestions then came in 
to uh, that this should be done with military teams and that military teams should be sent out to run mines in border provinces like Yunnan and Sichuan, while civilian public private joint stock companies would be perfectly suitable for developing and managing mines in China proper. Others echoed these ideas about the militarization of industrialization in the West. What these officials were suggesting was a development policy that differed for the borderlands where the state might use policies of military occupation. In other words, from early on then, the way the issue was considered and discussed, the thinking was not only to try and deny local communities control over local resources, but to do so potentially through armed action. When we fast forward, we sort of think about um, the development of calm after 1905 with a very bloody and brutal occupation by the Chinese central government, which was tied to mining development, um, it should be really no surprise perhaps. Or if we even fast forward to the 1950s or even today, where a lot of the economic development in important corporations are run by the production and construction core, the Bingtuan, Again, this is sort of an outcome, logical outcome of this long-term uh, thinking. In Yunnan, moreover, the concept of mining development, um, even after the revolution in 1911, 1912, uh, evolved to also be considered part of a civilizing uh, effort that mining companies could provide borderlands uh, indigenous people with work, proximity to Han citizens, a knowledge of Chinese, and an appreciation uh, of China. And so this thinking really reveals the links between economic development and new approaches to controlling and assimilating people uh, and territory in the West. For people of the borderlands, such as the elite Thai then, I think this helps us understand Fan Kashang and his outlook. Economic development schemes, including mining, were associated with exercise of state power and even violence and a loss of local control over resources that were then perhaps used to enrich outsiders. For Han Chinese and the government, including the Yunnan provincial government, modern mining came to be seen as a means to bring those alien people on Chinese soil under control while also gaining control of the resources for the state. But there was a catch to all of this in terms of at least the industrialization of mining in uh, the Southwest and in Yunnan in particular, and that's no one could actually make mechanized mining work, but Miao Yuntai could. And it was his approach then that uh, became extraordinarily important, not just for Yunnan, um, but for uh, China as a whole, I argue. So let's go back to Miao for a moment and uh, I'll wrap up so we can start uh, discussion. So Miao, Miao Yuntai returned uh, to Yunnan in 1928 and he was put in charge of a tin company down in the Southern part uh, of the province down in this area. Um, it was a tin company that actually had been uh, started 20 years earlier uh, under the previous uh, dynasty, um, but Miao would transform it. And he would transform it because he was innovative and he was innovative, I think, because he was shaped by both his own and Yunnan's past. As a native of Kun Kunming, as a, as a Yunnanese native, Miao thought of his home province as backwards, isolated, ethnically diverse, and therefore vulnerable. However, his personal experience was that he had gone abroad, he had been trained in Minnesota. Actually, this picture on the slide is from the Chinese Students Association at the University of Minnesota in about 1914, 1915 uh, or so. He'd gone abroad, he had work experience in New York City and in Shanghai. 
And so he had encountered a lot of business environments or a number of business environments, and he had a healthy respect for profitability in the market uh, as well. And if we put these various strands of personal uh, experience and Yunnan experience uh, together, we get a, a, a person in Miao Yuntai who emphasized that the state absolutely had to take the lead in economic development. In a place that was, uh, in his opinion, backwards and vulnerable like Yunnan, it was really only the state that could be in control. But at the same time, the state had to try to develop corporations that respected the market and produced uh, profit. Ideas that I think he really got from looking at how New York-based shareholding companies uh, or holding companies developed and uh, he got from his experience in, in Shanghai. So Miao brought these, this knowledge to the Tin Company. He brought this knowledge and belief in government planning and in corporate, in corporate efficiency to running uh, the tin company. He used company law to establish a robust board of directors. The board then invested in him as the general manager quite a bit of uh, autonomy. He was responsible for the company's uh, performance. He could hire and fire um, whom he wanted, and he also could set salaries for engineers uh, and management. And so it was this effort to try to create an efficient company that could make a profit, I think, that was really uh, quite important. And Miao used these ideas, used this approach to create the Yunnan Econom Economic Commission, a state entity that then built other corporations, including a very successful uh, textile, cotton textile uh, mill. So Miao gradually built up under the Yunnan Economic Commission, a stable of companies that were designed to be efficient and profitable. Now we can compare what was going on in Yunnan at this time to the national case, and it's really quite uh, uh, fascinating. The equivalent of the Yunnan Economic Commission nationally was the National Resources Commission or NRC. Um, but Yunnan, the Yunnan provincial government, an allegedly backwards border government, had actually uh, developed its own state-run corporations before the national government's NRC. In 1934, uh, the Yunnan Economic Commission had already started its first major development project, the mechanization of uh, cotton um, textile production. It wasn't until two years later in 1936 that the NRC began to build its own enterprises. So Yunnan outpaced the NRC on this. And it's probably for this reason that Miao Yuntai was actually uh, appointed a um, advisor to the NRC in 1936. Um, however, the Yunnan model of efficiency and profitability was actually not extended to the NRC. As Morris Bien ha has shown in his research, um, the NRC um, provided little uh, autonomy to their enterprises. They treated them as really sort of administrative uh, entities, both in terms of how the managers were ordered to run the corporations and uh, how they paid um, their uh, workers. So as Morris uh, has shown, the bureaucrat this bureaucratic approach uh, to state enterprises was really much more important uh, at, the, at the national level. And in the long run, it would be this NRC model that influenced the development of state enterprises after 1949, something also that uh, Professor Bien uh, has shown. But it's interesting because uh, in many ways, Miao Yuntai's approach would reappear after 1979. Whether he actually had a decisive role in that or not, I'm not quite sure. He was around, he was meeting with Deng Xiaoping, uh, Rong Yiren and so on. Uh, but that's a story for uh, a, a different day and I don't have a lot of evidence about that anyways. Whether Miao Yuntai actually played a decisive role after 1979 is, 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 does not matter really that much. 
because his influence on China was already quite important. By 1937, uh, he and his colleagues in Yunnan were developing corporate institutions that allowed the state to begin industrializing the province and to reach into the countryside to influence crop selection, land use, uh, credit, uh, and so on. As World War II came, moreover, it was the Yunnan provincial government that began harnessing these private companies, the, the private companies like Yongchangshan for the war effort. And at the same time, the provincial government was also becoming a leader in surveying its borderlands and developing schemes for state-led development in those areas, schemes that emphasized the power of outsiders in the state to dictate how resources would be exploited, thus relegating local people uh, to subsidiary roles. Uh, this included uh, actually trying to build state-run comp companies that competed with Yongchangshan and others. For example, uh, companies that, uh, a company that traded tea from Southern Yunnan up into Kham in Tibet was started by the Yunnan provincial government in connection with uh, the central government. And in, in Yunnan, in other words, we find perhaps uh, some of the most important early efforts to theorize and then implement state-run corporations, state control over natural resources and mining, state influence over private firms, and the use of economic development plans to control allegedly black backwards borderlands regions. And I go on to argue, book goes on to argue that these are defining characteristics of modern China uh, in many ways, and that these patterns would continue into the 1950s under communist rule, and that they were actually really important to the communist uh, party's ability to gain power uh, in places such as Kham and uh, Yunnan. But the story doesn't start after 1949. What's important to realize is that it starts really in the late 19th century when Chinese merchant corporations began transforming borderlands business practices, thereby bringing indigenous communities into more intense networks of regional and global trade. At the same time, Qing statesmen began to reconceive power and legitimacy in the borderlands and starting with Liu Changyo began to link that power and legitimacy to new state corporations. Over the long term then both the private and state sectors turned to corporate organizations to provide access to resources and communities, a process that has helped to produce stark inequalities in terms of economic well-being, access to opportunities and benefits from investments in China's vast and ethnically diverse West. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat, for this wonderful talk. Um, I believe now we have, we will hopefully have some questions from the audience, but in the meantime, I had been, I'd been really excited to read this book I, for, for really quite some time. Um, and I think it goes without saying that this is a must read for anyone trying to understand economic power and change in the Chinese borderlands. Um, and securing it within this late Qing to Republican period um, really you know, helps us further see how these merchants and their networks, businesses and business structure changed, permeated and eventually were tied into increasing disempowered development um, of the 20th century. Um, this, this work has been fundamental to the development of my own ideas uh, of, of borderland economies. And, and I, so I, I have some questions prepared, but I wanted to just see if anyone had posted any questions um, from our YouTube, uh, from the Weatherhead YouTube channel. Um, if you are listening and, and talking with us now, um, feel free to post your questions. We will uh, see them as they come. Uh, so I think at the moment we're still waiting to see if anybody is posted, but the, and so in the meantime, let me open it up with um, some questions that I've been thinking about quite a lot, uh, and especially today and listening to your talk. So 
I was wondering if you might speak more to the idea of the spread of business organizational technology, particularly during the earlier period um, in, you know, in the chapter one of your book. Um, mm -hmm. is, there, is there a way to trace the transference of accounting and business techniques? You, you suggest the idea of knowledge transfer between Shanxi merchants and Yunnanese businessmen, for example. Um, so I, I have some, I, and, and so you, you talk about this and you suggest it, and I think it's a very compelling idea. Um, but then you also, you know, include ideas about like the, the precepts for Yang Wendun, the, this man mm -hmm. how to do business. So could you talk a little bit more about business knowledge and transfers of, um, transference of um, technology for business and organization? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. I think that's a really important question, but it's also um, a question that's a little bit difficult to answer in certain ways. And, and maybe that's that's a really good reason to discuss it because there may be those out there who um, can also help to begin to fill in the in the gaps. I would love to see some of the gaps in knowledge filled in uh, mm -hmm. as as we go forward. Um, it, it, my my suggestion that that uh, Yunnan accounting and uh, profit sharing um, uh, approaches really came from Shanxi merchants is is a hypothesis. Um, it's really based more on the uh, similarities in um, bookkeeping and especially in the share in the uh, profit sharing uh, mechanisms that were um, developed uh, in Yunnan. There's no sort of, um, the term isn't a good one, but uh, smoking gun in terms of, um, you know, sort of this person met that person, uh, Yunnanese met a someone from Shanxi, and, um, you know, this is when uh, the ideas were, were, uh, were transferred. Um, one of the reasons it's difficult, I think, to really uh, trace is that um, in my um, in my research on the archives of of these businesses, it was really difficult um, to find um, record keeping and communications archives for before the twentieth century. And I began to be able to piece together some of that story. Um, there are local collectors who go around, um, who have gone around in uh, Yunnan over the years, sort of buying up at uh, local markets, uh, old documents. And um, some of these collections uh, have been put on uh, display in local museums. And I was fortunate to run into one in uh, Huashun uh, and in Tangchong uh, back a number of, of years ago, which showed accounting books and records um, from the earliest I saw was uh, 1858, I think. And um, what this allowed me to do was to be able to see that people were keeping day books, for example, merchants were keeping day books uh, at, at that time. And so, you know, it, it really sort of helps us to see that um, there was the use of accounting practices uh, at that time. But then I had to jump forward really into the 1870s or so before um, I could get my hands on some early ledgers that really showed sort of the shareholding um, process. And uh, even then there wasn't really sort of good um, evidence of uh, profit sharing at that point, that, that evidence comes even uh, a little bit uh, later. So really trying to sort of piece together exactly where the corporate management techniques came from, where the bookkeeping uh, techniques came from, where the profit sharing ideas came from. Um, it requires quite a bit of uh, uh, detective work. But once, um, once the Yunnanese got their hands on um, these sorts of uh, technologies, um, it does seem that one of the one of the communities in particular. So, so there are these different towns like Shijo that really develop these um, these uh, expertise, this expertise in developing companies and so on. And one of those uh, communities in particular, Hoqing, um, up in northern Yunnan, uh, seemed to actually provide a lot of the bookkeepers for different companies all around the province, just not just local uh, bookkeepers. So somehow there early on, record keeping really um, took off. 
And then we see actually that there was uh, competition uh, from companies elsewhere, Shido included, to sort of hire He Ching natives who were trained in, in, uh, in bookkeeping. Um, companies then went on to develop their own apprenticeship uh, programs in order to train uh, apprentices in bookkeeping. Um, we can see that this is really sort of uh, ingrained in local culture in some of the communities, because as you mentioned, um, we have uh, a few local sources uh, like the Yang Wen doing um, sort of this prose poem about um, going to Burma and doing business and how it impacts people and the, the community. We can really sort of see in that and in other sort of local materials how um, families were really beginning to emphasize uh, quantitative knowledge and the skills that were important uh, for businesses. So once these ideas get transferred into Yunnan, we can really see families and even communities, uh, we can see taking root in those places, really this um, sort of uh, institutionalized approach within the family or within a business uh, of how to train people in these, in these technologies. But there's more that we could know about, about this. The, the effort to try to trace it back in time, I think, is, is worthwhile. Thank you so much. And we now have a few questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to go with this second question because it relates directly to what you were just saying um, from John Hartman. So how did these changes in economic organization affect the ways of life or the worldviews throughout the broader society? Was there societal resistance? Yeah, uh, ex extremely good uh, question. I, th there's a multiple ways to um, answer this. And so let me, um, first, I very much appreciate Professor Hartman uh, asking that question. Um, but let me answer it just, um, I, I think, in uh, a couple of ways. One that builds off the last answer and another um, that may be um, of interest to him, uh, I, I hope. Um, so uh, changes in economic uh, organization affected the, the towns that merchants came from quite a bit. And I do, I spend um, a fair bit of time in a couple of the chapters uh, exploring this because I'm trying to really sort of understand the transformations both in these oases really of cosmopolitanness and money as opposed to uh, the places that really are kind of on the losing end of, uh, of uh, commercial uh, development. And so in uh, the merchant uh, communities, um, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that as more and more people built companies and as um, it became quite common for local men and boys to spend long periods of time uh, away from uh, home and away from the family, that this was actually fairly traumatic. Um, the Yang Wendun, as, as you, you mentioned, Elizabeth, um, it, it's, a, you know, it's a really a, a sort of a poem that is designed for people to memorize. And it talks a lot about um, the difficulties of being away from home, the temptations, um, opium addiction in Mandalay, uh, marrying into Burmese families, which would then sever ties back to the home uh, families, uh, parents, perhaps why a wife that's been left behind, behind maybe uh, even, uh, even children. And so what I was able to piece together is that there really is sort of this reluctant change in certain sectors of uh, Yunnanese merchant society. So as, as these companies become uh, much bigger, much more institutionalized, people are spending longer periods uh, away from uh, home. And it's really uh, traumatic for the society uh, as a whole. Um, women are having to take on a lot more responsibilities in the home. Uh, you have stories locally in some of these communities uh, about grandmothers and so on who really just sort of ran everything. Um, and so this was really a, 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 an interesting uh, change, but it also made these communities, it provided these communities with real sort of links to the world. Um, 
and really an outward sort of um, looking uh, approach where um, some of the more elite kids would just sort of expect to go to Nanjing for college or even to Harvard Business School as one of the, um, as one of Yan Zijun's uh, sons uh, does. So there's a real sort of transformation of worldview in these, um, in these uh, merchant uh, communities, but they really were not very uh, easily, it wasn't easy to experience, uh, I think. Um, in some of the communities like um, in Western Yunnan and some of the Dai uh, communities uh, there, um, these changes in economic organization and political uh, organization were really quite wrenching. Um, you can see this in, in some of the Kampa uh, areas as well. Um, within migration uh, of Han, we see sort of new economic hierarchies being formed. Uh, shopkeepers and so on tend to be Han in a lot of the Kampa uh, uh, communities. Um, there really is a sense um, that um, these outside companies have a fair bit of control. There's a lot of land around uh, some of the Thai domains uh, in Western Yunnan that is sort of taken over as uh, areas to pasture the the um, the mules and so on from the big mule trains for these for these uh, companies. And there's also quite a bit of of violence um, at times over uh, some of the economic and political changes that are taking place uh, in Western Yunnan. In the 20s and 30s, um, there were examples of uh, Kachin and Thai sort of banding together and killing Han, uh, of Yunnanese troops coming in and raising uh, dozens of villages uh, at a time. So um, I think that this really sort of shows, both of these cases show that um, you know, this was obviously um, a world that was changing rapidly and there was quite a bit of societal resistance to a number of the different trends. Thanks. So we have another question from Ben uh, Savani. Um, I think he also mentioned he had to leave at 1 p.m. So uh, apologies for not getting to your question sooner. But his question is, how would you characterize the role um, the borderland played in informing tensions between local, national, and cosmopolitan identities in the first half of the 20th century? Oh, gee, this is, this is a challenging uh, one. I, I, uh, I hope uh, Ben is still listening. If he's not, maybe you can look at the uh, recording. Um, the Whoops, we just got a new uh, question. So his his moved on me in the in the group uh, uh, chat. Oh, would you would you like me to read the question again? No, no, no. I, I've I've got it. I've got it. So the tensions between local, national, and cosmopolitan um, uh, identities. I think. Let me answer this. I'm not sure if this is going to quite answer the question. But it's, it's an answer that I think might be interesting um, to people. Um, so these companies, um, as they were uh, built and the people who built them and who were managers and who were involved in them, um, they were really sort of linked together in these trans-provincial, trans-regional, transnational uh, organizations that were linked by the general manager's office back in Kunming. That was sort of the hub. The communications, the sending of the uh, bookkeeping records uh, and so on, the strategic communications between the general headquarters uh, in the branches, whether in Mandalay, Kolkata, um, whatever, we can really sort of, if, we, if you think about it, if you sort of plot it geographically, these companies had a, a really sort of fascinating geography where the hub was Kunming but sort of the geography of circulation of information, people, commodities, profits, losses, and so on was um, linked East Asia, 
uh, to Tibet, to South Asia, uh, to uh, Southeast Asia. And what I think is interesting about that is that it did make these people quite uh, cosmopolitan in important ways. And it totally clashed with um, the government, especially after 1949, the People's Republic's government in its approach to how it thought about space and identity. So one thing the book does at the end in the epilogue is it talks about the state, um, the the Gong the the, uh, the state sort of takeover uh, of the private companies, and what I came to realize is that when the Yunnan and central PRC governments dismantled these companies, what they were doing was actually taking over these companies and their assets uh, and then dismantling them or re-territorializing them in different ways. Whereas it had been, these companies were sort of hubs of uh, trans-regional trade and so on. What the PRC government did was like it took the mines that a company might own and put it under the local government there, say in Southern uh, Yunnan. It took the silk filatures these companies might own up in Sichuan and put it under the local or the provincial government there. Uh, it took the trading hubs in Kunming and put it under the Yunnan provincial government. So it sort of took these very cosmopolitan trans-regional organizations and re-territorialized them according to administrative uh, logic of provinces, towns, uh, and the nation. And so it was, it was a real sort of transformation, I think, from a transnational sort of uh, approach to corporate uh, building to back to a very much sort of administrative government uh, approach to governing the, the economy and the people who worked in those companies. That is very, that is super interesting. And I actually would love to follow up more on that question in a little, or, you know, on that topic, I've got some questions to um, ask later, but in the meantime, we have another question from the audience. Uh, Huang Ziyang is asking, how did corporate management interact with other forms of governance, like local chiefs, bureaucracy, or military control? Did warlord localism affect what approach is favored towards local management? It's a very interesting question. Yeah, a really, uh, a really good uh, uh, question. And um, let me uh, let me answer that in uh, in a in a couple of uh, different ways. Um, for the big Yunnan companies, um, their the the relationship to uh, War, the warlord governments of, of, of Yunnan um, could be helpful and it could be dangerous. Um, and so we actually see um, some members of the uh, Yunnan uh, um, provincial government, uh, Long Yun and his family and so on, actually in, investing in some of the uh, companies, not so much in the companies from Western Yunnan, which I, uh, I focused on, but certainly um, in, uh, in other uh, Yunnan companies. So they were, uh, they could be uh, shareholders, uh, could be uh, providing uh, capital uh, to, to, the, uh, to the firms. Um, at the same time, um, especially as we went into the wartime period, there's a real tension at times between the private companies um, and um, the, uh, the warlord government, Long Yun's um, government. So we, we see Miao Yun Tai in, uh, in the Long Yun administration really sort of trying to capture um, private company trade for the war effort, you know, to get these people who are importing cotton and textiles, for example, to be, um, you know, concentrating on, on providing uniforms for the, for the military or, or things, uh, stuff like that. Um, and so we see an effort in, in order to make them do that, they're, 
there emerged a whole sort of process in which the companies had to register what they were importing and exporting. And they actually had to um, take foreign currency and uh, in terms of any profits and so on, and uh, you know, turn it over, exchange it in the, in the provincial government uh, uh, bank. So there were real sort of efforts at control there and um, there's at least uh, one or two incidents that I know of in which uh, when the merchants actually didn't follow um, the rules that were being developed, um, that, uh, for example, a Long Yun's son um, actually took uh, a couple of um, merchant uh, shareholders uh, into custody and sort of held them and, uh, and, and, and took a lot of their, um, their, their goods that they were importing without any, any permission. So there, there could be friction, uh, there could be uh, some cooperation. When we get up into your area of the, of the, uh, of the world, up into, uh, up into calm, it becomes really messy. And I would love to hear some of your, your thoughts on this too. But what I'm able to um, piece together is that um, if, if we look at what I've done, uh, we look at um, some of Joseph Lawson's work uh, and so on, that uh, Eastern Tibet is really sort of this messy place where um, warlords and mer Chinese merchants have control in some places, uh, monasteries and uh, local chiefs, I guess you could call them, um, have a lot of economic power uh, in other places. So what I found is that in places like Litang, um, it was really the, the local monastery that, uh, and, and the, the uh, merchant monks, for lack of a better uh, term, who really sort of controlled transactions there and the, the, the Chinese firms had to work with them and actually got capital for, from them in, 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 in certain uh, uh, cases. But if you move a little bit further to the uh, east, you have a geography really where um, it's the Chinese shopkeepers and uh, the, the uh, Chinese firms that seem to have much more of a grasp over local uh, trade in the headmen and the monasteries seem to have um, much less influence. So that's sort of how I would uh, begin answering that, that question. Not sure if you have thoughts on that, Elizabeth. Yeah, no, thank you. I, um, you know, it's a very interesting question. And I think there's a lot to, there's a lot to learn from the comparison. And I think your, your book does a wonderful job having that chapter in there, um, uh, talking about Kham and, and Yunnan and Yunnanese merchants in particular, their, their impact on the, the region of Kham. Um, and particularly looking at that, that lower, strata of society. Um, so for me, that was incredibly interesting to see how that kind of lower strata, the, the, the you know, the so-called peasants or commoners who are um, in these obligation relationships with local power structures, such as monasteries or perhaps chieftains, um, but that they had these sideline businesses uh, right. with the Yunnanese companies, which you know, it was so interesting to, to look at and think about because um, my own work, so my, um, the, the, the manuscript I'm now uh, working on is called uh, Tibet Incorporated, Institutional Power and Economic Practice on the Sino-Tibetan Borderland, uh, 1930 to 1950. Um, this project looks, my project looks a lot at the elite levels um, of these, of this borderland region. And so, um, for me, you know, seeing that you know, just even a little bit about the medicinal herb gathering and selling was, was incredibly, um, incredibly enlightening because a lot of what I deal with the access to that level um, and thinking about that element of economic activity is extremely rare. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll, I can, um, you know, in, in addition to what uh, Pat said, because every, you know, that was, uh, that make what he was saying and just to just to add to it. Um, I do think that, you know, what we're seeing between Kham and Yunnan, and it really does relate to these longer term uh, 
interactions, um, say with the, you know, thinking about the Qing dynasty's interaction and Pat's first book, you know, is a fabulous look at this, you know, Qing period, uh, Yunnanese, um, uh, you know, merchants and, and commerce and uh, these institutional um, interactions. And what you see in Kham is not nearly as developed in this kind of earlier Qing period. You, you have the presence of the Qing, but what you end up having, it, it's not nearly as strong until um, one of the topics that Pat talks about in his book is the Zhao or Feng period. So this late Qing period where you finally have a very intensive um, and overtly colonizing process occurring in the Sino-Tibetan uh, Kham region. Um, so I think it's, you, there's a lot, it's, but in that case, it's almost like an intensive uh, burst of control that with the fall of the Qing creates a bit of a vacuum of not only uh, knowledge transfer um, of power structures or of, uh, you know, the presence of these pole, different poles, so Tibet, uh, central Tibetan governance and Chinese governments. There, it becomes this sort of region of, of a power vacuum. And so then when the Chinese come in, and, uh, at least in the state presence, when they come in more forcefully in the first half of the 20th century, you really do see what, what Pat was saying is this patchwork uh, assortment of power. And um, what I end up looking at quite a lot in my own work is seeing exactly how Tibetan economic power um, from a, you know, almost a Tibetan economic agency perspective, how these local um, economic institutions like monasteries um, uh, really flourish during this period. Um, but to bring it back to a, a question that I, I had for, for Pat, um, which relates a little bit to the, the previous question, um, is part of my work looks at a, uh, a family merchant company called the Punditsons who were a, had, they were basically three brothers uh, in this broad Tibetan region covering central Tibet and Kham and doing business uh, with local uh, Chinese state structures in Kham, um, doing business with uh, Indians in British India, uh, the, the, Britain, the, the British in British India, um, and with a Yunnanese company called the Chenho Industrial Corporation. Um, so I, the question really is, what does, you know, I, I really wonder about this, you know, you, you structure your book, your book really nicely in thinking about private enterprise and then state run enterprise. And then sort of the narrative arc towards the end is this idea that the state led corporation encompasses and takes over the private. Um, and you were in sort of like, uh, you were mentioning this a little bit um, about, especially when the, the communists come in and what that looks like. Um, and while I do think that that seems like a really uh, compelling point of massive departure, I really was wondering more about what, what does a state-led corporation look like it, when you are comparing say the late Qing period to the you know, late thirties and forties, how does that look? And um, as a follow-up, how does the incorporation or the interaction with private companies change it um, as we move forward in time? Yeah. So in other words, in part, sort of how does a, how does a state-run corporation look in the 1930s under Miao Yuntai's directorship, for example, uh, as compared to a, a, a Guandu Shangban or a, a, a state um, merchant joint stock company um, of, of, the, of the Qing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is something that um, I think it's really uh, is really an interesting uh, question. If we if we look at the scholarship um, on uh, the uh, the Qing era um, sort of uh, state private uh, companies. We really get a sense that, uh, in, 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 again, um, Morris Bien has has uh, has elaborated on this, and, and others lie and so on have have uh, elaborated uh, on this. We really get a sense of uh, 
of organizations that are um, where, where the efforts to be efficient and make a profit, and those efforts are coming from the merchants who buy into these organizations, um, whether it's China Merchant Steamship or, or whatever, can be easily undermined by um, the, um, the administrator, the Qing official, who's sort of sitting on top of this, doing the supervising, which was the model that the, the state would supervise um, these, these companies. And so even though it's uh, you know, organized as a joint stock company with um, you know, supposedly then um, shareholders being able to have a say in uh, governance and, uh, and so on, that the state at any sort of point in time um, can really sort of undermine uh, the efficiency uh, of, of, the, of the corporation based on sort of policy necessities or the need for revenue uh, uh, even. And it was precisely that that Miao Yuntai was trying to guard against, that he was trying to figure out, you know, sort of how you could create a corporate governance structure in which that could not uh, happen. Uh, he particularly was adamant that what he was trying to create were uh, state-run corporations uh, that also had private um, shareholders uh, as, as well. And that the decision-making uh, was in the hands of the managers um, and the decision-making therefore was, you know, sort of how to best use resources in, it in, in order to uh, produce uh, profit. And I think that what he was able to uh, do was he really was able by creating the Yunnan Economic Commission to sort of give a little bit of space from the, the, the Yunnan government itself, give a little bit of space between the government and its sort of policy needs and so on. And then um, this powerful economic and corporate arm uh, of of the uh, of the Yunnan prov provincial government, and it's hard to say entirely, but it does seem that uh, shareholders um, did have a bigger voice in um, in running uh, the Tin Corporation and 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 so on uh, as, as well. So it's I don't think he was entirely successful in sort of. Uh, absolutely coming up with a, an incredibly new uh, organization. But uh, the fact that he could make these things a little bit more autonomous from the needs of the administrative government, I think, um, sort of differentiates the 1930s in, in Yunnan from uh, the late 19th century uh, in, the, in the Qing. So you, you get people wanting to invest in these uh, companies. When the central government comes into the Southwest and um, you know sets up the wartime capital in Chongqing, but also has an increasing presence in uh, Kunming, you get um, you know central government banks and and stuff like that really wanting to invest. Uh, not only because um, not only because uh, Miao has sort of created these. Um, these companies that deal with really important strategic things like tin uh, and cotton or, or, or cloth, but also because they 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 put a they give you a return on your investment. I, I just think it's so interesting because especially because of the govern the diversity of governance that we see from the late Qing through the Republican period, you know, up until really the communist takeover. And the, the regionality and the local, like the localness, while the sim with the simultaneous incredible connectivity um, to this now, you know, what, we're, what we might, might call global capitalism. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is where this is where I would just, you know, give a shout out to Judd Kinsley in his uh, book on uh, Xinjiang because his idea of layers, this idea that you know there especially in the late Qing and then especially in the Republican period, you just, 
you have these new governments sort of coming in, they're localized, they have some connections to the national government or they're influenced by uh, outside powers, in his case, the Soviet Union, but that these state-run corporations sort of get built up in one era, taken over, repurposed uh, in, an, in another uh, era, and that each sort of uh, new uh, layer of development is kind of shaping things uh, in a different way, but you still have that sort of historical trajectory um, under underlying uh, it all. And I, I think that's a valuable way uh, to think about uh, what what's going on. I think it's a valuable way um, in terms of uh, Yunnan because you have um, you know, sort of private firms that establish certain types of trade routes in relationship with indigenous uh, communities, relationships of, of, of power. And then you have state run corporations that are sort of really designed actually to compete with them and take over those uh, routes and, uh, and relationships to sort of lay, layer on top of and even incorporate some of those private firms into uh, the state uh, administration. And um, so if you think of that as kind of a complicated uh, layering process, then it, um, I think it can be really uh, produ a productive way to sort of analyze some of the historical trajectories and changes that are, that are taking place. Definitely. Um, I, I believe we are out of time. Um, this has been such a wonderful conversation and thank you so much for your talk. Um, if you, if uh, you in the audience, if you haven't gotten a copy or read it, I highly recommend <laughs> it. Uh, wonderful, really wonderful book. Um, and thank you so much for the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for organizing this um, and to the Modern Tibetan Studies Program at Columbia as well. So thank you so much, Pat Giersch. Um, this has been great and I, We'll let you say goodbye as well. well I, I just want to—I want to thank Weatherhead as well, uh, Modern Tibetan Studies, uh, and uh, of course you, Elizabeth. I really appreciate your uh, work on moderating here. It's been such a pleasure, just sort of talking a little bit about the book, and uh, I hope others enjoyed it as much as I did.